Yeah, first of all, let me say <clears throat> it's of course a pleasure and an honor to receive this award um, named after <clears throat> this gentleman, Ivano Bertini. Uh, well, first of all, I wish to thank Lucia for her kind words and the Laudatio. I wish to thank those who have nominated me for the award. I wish to thank the awards committee for making this decision. And last but not least, um, I wish to thank the sponsor of this award, Luca. Um, I think this award is meant to be and it should be seen as a tribute to Ivano Bertini. I think in my eyes, <clears throat> when I met him um, over the years, I mean he was fitting to somebody who spent most of his life in Florence, a kind of a renaissance man, which means that he had talents going not in just one field that went beyond science, as a matter of fact, beyond pure science, for instance, in setting up the wonderful institute in Florence. Here he is with his friend Harry Gray, whom I know very well from my time at Caltech. Now, <clears throat> what I will do today is um, I will focus my talk almost entirely on the molecular machinery of protein degradation, structural studies ex situ, that is what we do by single particle analysis, and then in situ. I need the ex situ part to introduce basically the molecule we are studying and its, its properties. So <clears throat> I think this is a very simplistic view of the eukaryotic protein degradation pathway. It is the ubiquitin proteasome system, which is the most important pathway for protein degradation, intracellular protein degradation in eukaryotes. So proteins destined for degradation, they are labeled with polyubiquitin, tetraubiquitin chains, and they are recognized by this molecular machinery, the 26S proteasome. It's a 2.5 megadalton complex. It's a relatively labile complex, I have to say. It comprises a core complex here where protein degradation takes place in the cavity here where the active sites are located. So any substrate to be degraded has to travel to this cavity here in the interior of the core particle. In order to be functional, it has to associate with one or two regulatory particles. Their role is, in a nutshell, to prepare substrates for degradation in the core complex. That means they recognize ubiquitinated proteins, they deubiquitinate them, and then, <clears throat> I mean, they assist, or they unfold them, and they assist in the translocation here into the core complex. Now, what the proteasome does, it, it generates, it cleaves substrates into oligopeptides, which are typically between 8 and 12 residues long. They are of very little use to the cell, with the notable exception of the immune system, but even then, usually some further trimming is required. So there's a whole machinery downstream of the proteasome, and um, I mean, central to that is a large molecule, a 6 megadalton <coughs> complex called trepeptidyl peptidase. It cleaves off three peptides from these oli oligopeptides here. <clears throat> and these are then further degraded uh, downstream by an array of amino peptidases um, to, to complete the catabolic cycle. Now, what I will do in the talk, I will spend a minute or two on this molecule here. It's very large, but it's, it has basically a very simple architecture. We determined its structure about 10 years ago using a hybrid approach. So the building block of the molecule is, and that is the crystal structure we determined at the time, um, <clears throat> is a dimer. Now, essentially, we have, I mean, an N-terminal term, uh, an N-terminal domain here, in which, I mean, the, the active site residues are, are um, located. Then we have a central domain, they form basically together with <clears throat> an insert forming another separate domain, the main body here of, of the molecule. And then at the C-terminus, we have an array of, um, <clears throat> well, helical bundle, very large helical bundle, as a matter of fact. That is a bit variable between species, and this variability means that, well, that causes, as a matter of fact, the absence or presence of one or, or two of these helices <coughs> changes the curvature here of, of the whole molecule, because these dimers, they assemble in a linear way here, <clears throat> basically stacking the dimers together and form two intertwined strands here. Now, the curvature, I mean, in turn, determines basically the length. And for that reason, let's say the molecule is, let's say, um, two um, elements shorter 
in, uh, in humans as compared, for instance, to, to Drosophila. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on TPP2, that is all published work. I want to make basically the point, and that is the hallmark, essentially, of all intracellular proteases, that they are what we like to call self-compartmentalizing. That means they form basically cavities, and these cavities um, sequester the active sites from the environment. So as shown here schematically, any substrate to be degraded by TPP2 has to enter left and right of this, uh, of this helical bundle here. And then, I mean, it, it goes to what we call the antechamber. There, and that separates, or that, I mean, acts as a kind of a filter. It does not allow the passage of folded proteins. It allows only the passage of these kind of oligopeptides released by the proteasome, and then they enter here the catalytic chamber where they are degraded. Now, <clears throat> I think the more interesting molecule is, of course, the, the proteasome. We began to work on that um, about 30 years ago, as a matter of fact. And it was in 1995, in the cooperation with Robert Huber's group, that we solved the structure of the core particle here. That was a four or five years effort. Today, I mean, one would do it by cryo-EM, single particle analysis. It has become a very popular test sample for single particle analysis. This is a structure done in a day or two <coughs> by cryo-EM to a resolution of 2.1, 2 2.2 angstroms. Now, <clears throat> I think the importance of that early work was that for a long time, the active site of the proteasome remained enigmatic. It could not be identified by molecular biology or biochemical techniques. But it showed that it was a unique type of active site, the N-terminal threonine, and a unique uh, hydrolytic mechanism at the time. Now, <clears throat> that immediately <clears throat> suggested a way of creating inhibitors against the, against the 20S proteasome. And uh, basically, the idea was to sort of elongate or kind of cap the N-terminal residues here so that the, the threonine was no longer the N-terminal residue. And I think the most potent one at that time became a deep peptide boronate, which is shown here. And that translated, as a matter of fact, in record time into a drug for the treatment of multiple myeloma. But that was not our work. But um, I was very skeptical that um, the 20S proteasome would be a very good target. Uh, I think everybody on the advisory board was skeptical, but uh, it turned out to, to work extremely well. Now, I should say that <clears throat> um, the 20S proteasome um, cannot act on its own. It needs to associate with molecules which, I mean, essentially unfold the substrate to be degraded. So um, the simplest form of that is called PAN, proteasome activating nucleotidase. That is a very recent structure here. Uh, this took a long time. It's an extremely unstable complex here. You see, the resolution is, oops, resolution is, um, is um, decent and the core particle. Then as we go to the end terminus where we have a cold coil that acts as a kind of a swinging arm, resolution is, of course, much worse and also in the so-called OB domain, it's a little bit lower. Nevertheless, I think this, the structure provided some important insights, I should say, because we analyzed very large data sets, and so we could define the conformational landscape of that, and that gave us an idea of, of the functional cycle. So what you see here is basically that each sub, um, subunit of uh, the six subunits of, um, of, this, um, of the palm part of the molecule I mean, goes through a functional cycle, a rotary kind of a functional cycle, a rotary mechanism of ATP hydrolysis. And that drives these movements here going up and down on the alpha subunit ring of the core particle. I think that is shown, I mean, also in this movie here. Um, and then, of course, I mean, that drives also movements of the N terminal domains <coughs> of the molecule. Now, <coughs> The eukaryotic system is quite a bit more complicated. Instead of just, I mean, the AAA ATPase, there, is, <clears throat> there are many other subunits there, ubiquitin receptors, um, and as I said before, the ubiquitinases, etc., etc. Now, that is a structure, I mean, <clears throat> um, we did um, something like seven years ago, or something that was before the resolution revolution, so we got stuck at a resolution of something like 
seven, eight angstroms. So in order to make sense of that structure, to determine the molecular architecture, we joined forces with Rudi Ebersold, Andre Charlie, and because we could interpret the density map only in the light of cross-linking data and, and mass spec <coughs> data, providing constraints for the interpretation of the structure, which turned out to be quite accurate in retrospect. Now, what follows is now a movie describing basically the architecture of the 26S particle, um, and also it's meant that is important for what follows for the in situ studies. It describes, I mean, the conformational landscape um, of the molecule now, I'm getting a little bit right that this movie is not moving. Um, now something happens, okay. At the core of the regulatory particle in the 26S complex is what you see in blue here. It's again the AAA HPS um, um, module. Then we have, I mean, highlighted here, the ubiquitin receptors, the deubiquitinating module, which is essentially a heterodimer here of RPN11, RPN8. So well, that is now integrated, we distinguish between the base, and the so-called lid of the molecule here, that the base is, is, the, is mostly the ATPase. The lid is basically most of the subunits there. I mean, they position the ubiquitin receptor, they position the, the ubiquitase, but many of them have only a structural role. Basically, they coordinate some of the movements the molecule has to undergo during its functional cycle. So we will take a little bit of closer look at that without going into any detail. There are many <coughs> groups now working on that. And so I think we have a pretty good coverage of the conformational landscape during the functional cycle. So we began with, I mean, the ground state in which the molecule is not dealing with any substrate. The prime state is a state in which the molecule um, essentially, in which it's not yet degraded. But the process of degradation at that stage has become irreversible because um, um, so it's, it's already firmly attached to the molecule but not yet unfolded. Then it follows by a different substrate processing states. I can't go into the detail. <coughs> Essentially, it has to perform very large scale conformational changes to bring down the substrate from the initial receptors to the mouth of the AAA ATPs for unfolding. The unfolding channel of the AAA ATPS has to be aligned <coughs> with the gate that controls access to the core particle in, um, in a gate in the alpha rings. Without going into further detail here, basically the insertion of the C-terminals of some of these ATPases, RPN1 and RPN6, into, um, into little slots in the, in the alpha subunit rings triggers gate opening, as you see here. Now, I think I now, the remainder of my talk, I will talk about structural studies in situ because, as you know, the main interest of the lab is in cryo-electron tomography. I, you have heard about, I mean, the procedures uh, from, from Julia. Uh, this is, I mean, um, a lamella. In this case, it, it looks nicer than the lamella on the rod outer segments because, I mean, Chlamydomonas is a very well-behaved little organism here. It's interesting because it has a well-defined organelle topology that makes many things easier, and it's a little bit less crowded than other cells. So what we can do is essentially we can zoom into any part of this tomogram and do then extract um, molecular features, do subtomogram averaging, and so on. But we are focused entirely here, entirely here on the 26S proteasome. So I think if you look at this column here, it shows um, in, in the fluorescent images where the proteasomes are located. Essentially, roughly half of all proteasomes are located in the nucleus, um, most of them in close vicinity to the nuclear envelope. And the other, I mean, half is in the cytoplasm. But it's, it's, it's very focused here, at least in Chlamydomonas. You see these two spots here. These are clusters of large clusters of proteasomes sitting essentially on the endoplasmic reticulum. So we zoom in now in the tomogram, and these are the original data without any post-processing. So this is part of the nuclear envelope, that is the location of a nuclear um, core complex here. And you see even in the raw images without first-processing, first 
the features of the 26 s proteasome. So you can very easily extract these molecules here and create subtomogram averages here at a kind of a medium resolution. Now, <clears throat> what we can do with methods very similar to what is done in single particle analysis, we can do a classification of the molecules and we can very easily distinguish between molecules which have one regulatory particle or two regulatory particles we can discriminate at least between the two most populated um, um, <clears throat> uh, conformations here. And from the conformation, we can infer which molecule is in the ground state and which one is in the substrate processing state. We cannot easily distinguish that from, let's say, the prime state. <laughs> No, but that will, will come as the resolution gets better and better. Now we can also, and that is important, I mean, discriminate between proteasomes which are tethered to different cellular structures. And th we can do this in a fairly quantitative way. Now, the, the nice thing is that we retain information about where each and every molecule comes from. So we have here a tomogram. Uh, this is, I mean, the nuclear envelope here. Here we are in the cytoplasm, so we see a mitochondria in here. This is a nuclear pore complex. So here we see single and double capped 26 s proteasomes. Then we can differentiate between those in the ground state, these are the green ones, and those which are in the substrate processing state, and then we can distinguish between uh, the different interactions in the cell. Now, going a little bit more deeply into that, those in the vicinity of nuclear pore complexes, we have two very clear subpopulations. One that is, I mean, relatively close to the eightfold axis of the nuclear pore complex, but further away from the membrane level here, the membrane level would be here. This population here is tethered directly to the membrane at the periphery of the nuclear pore complex. And you see that here because we can pick individual nuclear pore complexes and can map back the two different um, molecules belonging to these two different populations here. You see the yellow ones here, they are further away. They are very clearly, and we see that also directly, tethered to the so-called basket of the nuclear pore complex. So the basket is kind of decorated with proteasomes. Occupancy <coughs> is never really complete. Here we have of the eight sites, only seven are occupied. Here of the eight, only six are occupied, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> we cannot push that to very high resolution because the nuclear basket is extremely flexible. So basically, it led to the discovery, if you like, of these two different populations. We believe that this one here is involved in import-export surveillance. This one here is probably involved, um, is directly tethered. It's the only site where <clears throat> at the nuclear pore complex where the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope and the inner membrane of the nuclear envelope uh, continuous, but they nevertheless they maintain a distinct protein composition, and that is in part achieved by the proteasome extracting proteins and degrading them. That is very similar to what we see in another important system in the cell in ER associated protein degradation. And as I told you, most of the cytoplasmic proteasomes they are somehow associated with the endoplasmic reticulum. So basically, the AIRNAT system, as it is known and well studied biochemically in terms of molecular biology, is about the following. Proteins synthesized on the endoplasmic reticulum, they're imported into the ER where they are supposed to fold properly with the assistance of chaperones. But that often enough goes wrong, and we have uh, aggregation or misfolding here. And uh, particularly under stress conditions, so we have what has been studied very widely and deeply is the unfolded protein response. <coughs> but there's no degradation system inside the ER, and in order to get rid, they have to be retrotranslocated into the, into the cytoplasm. And passing, I mean, the membrane here, they become ubiquitinated and degraded by the 26S proteasome. Now, <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to go into the details of the very complex air machinery. It's highly conserved, and we can also, what we can say is that in <coughs> Chlamydomonas, basically the entire system, as we find it also in, in humans or <coughs> in other eukaryotic systems, is conserved. What has been unknown is essentially how, on a supramolecular level, the ERAT system is organized. 
And what we find is the following. So here we have a piece of ER. These are um, secreted vesicles from the ER. A lot of the protein synthesis done by ribosomes in blue is done here on the, on the opposite side. But it's always interrupted by clusters of molecules which are 26 as proteasomes. These clusters are typically 30, 40 molecules, comprise 30, 40 molecules. <clears throat> and we, we went into a deeper analysis of that system. <clears throat> Again, I don't want to go into the details of the, uh, the image processing strategy here. We have not exactly done template matching here. What we have done is essentially we picked in these small confined regions here, all the densities went through iterative classification and separating, I mean, the molecules, the densities found there um, according to similarity. And then, I mean, the subclasses were, I mean, uh, subjected to subtomogram averaging. So essentially, we have, I mean, of the larger components, and basically there's not much more. You have 26 cell proteasomes, you have ribosomes, but they are very clearly separated. Um, <clears throat> and then, I mean, a key player is another AAA ATPA CDC48. Now that, I mean, resolution is quite a bit lower here because it's a very low abundance molecule compared to the other ones. Also, it's quite a bit smaller. Nevertheless, I mean, by picking the density and with the reference-free alignment, things converge into a structure very similar to CDC48. As a matter of fact, I think some additional evidence that we are right there comes from comparing, um, um, let's say, the concentration of these molecules here by conventional mass spec, and doing that versus, I mean, counting the molecules identified by, um, by the procedure I just described. Now you see ribosomes, I mean, are, uh, are very abundant. Proteasomes are, of course, much less abundant. There seems to be a little bit of a discrepancy, but that is due to the fact that we counted only the proteasomes here in the cytoplasm, whereas, I mean, we ignored in our measurements here those in the nucleus. The CDC48, in spite of the fact it's relatively low abundance, so I think the agreement is pretty good. So we can go back and visualize now by mapping back these three molecules <clears throat> to these clusters here. We get a feeling of the internal organization of these degradation clusters here. So you see it now emerging here. You see it's all this I mean, located opposite to the site where the properly folded proteins are secreted. So <clears throat> Yeah, you see uh, the cluster of 26S, to our surprise. Um, in yellow, you see CDC48. We expected to see CDC48 um, basically mostly very close to the membrane because the idea is that CDC48 is the first step in sort of extracting and unfolding um, proteins coming from the endoplasmic reticulum and then handing them over to the 26S proteasome. But I think our tomograms are in, in not quite in agreement with this kind of mental image. Um, <clears throat> so we, we take a closer look now at the 26 cell proteasomes in those clusters here. We can um, discriminate the functional states. Typically, it's only something like 20% or so of all proteasomes we find and identify are in the substrate processing state. But what we see, I mean, when we look at activity directly attached to the membrane, the activity is quite a bit higher then. And if we take that subpopulation here and do subtomogram averaging, we see additional density directly attached to <clears throat> the complex and, in fact, directly attached to RPN1, which is one of the ubiquitin receptors. So we think there are, might be two kinds of mechanism, one we call direct ERAT, in which I mean the 26 cell proteasome is directly involved in extracting <coughs> um, molecules from the endoplasmic reticulum for degradation, and indirect ERAT, where I mean the first action comes from CDC48, but this is still um, under, under investigation. Um, well, I think in the, in the last part of my talk, I will tell you a little bit about a project that uh, has kept us busy in the last uh, five years or so, called TOPAC, I mean, funded by an ERC Synergy Grant, Toxic Protein Irrigation and Neurodegeneration. I will show you a single example from that work. Um, you will hear more about that in, in the afternoon from Robin. <clears throat>
It's basically a collaboration between Ulrich Hartl's lab, who is interested in how do aggregates affect proteostasis networks? Can we boost cellular defenses against aggregation? My colleague Matthias Mann, a proteomics expert. What is the composition of the aggregates and how does the cellular proteome change in response to toxic protein aggregation? Um, our interest is what is the in situ structure of the aggregates and how do they interact with the cellular environment? Now, I think the system I'm going to describe briefly is a system that recapitulates the symptoms of ALS. The hallmark of that disease is basically hexanucleotide expansion in this gene here, which really uh, translates into the production of toxic D peptides. What is found in the brains of those patients is basically amine glycine alanine repeats here. Now, if we express a construct, I mean, uh, mimicking the system um, and go through the workflow, I think uh, after Julia's talk, I don't need to go into detail. So we grow the neurons here directly on, on the grids. We use fluorescence microscopy to identify cells carrying um, um, an aggregate material, and we target it by focused ion beam. We can confirm <clears throat> by fluorescence microscopy that our lamella contains the aggregate, and then we can take a tomogram. Now, what you see here is a tomogram now of um, such an aggregate. What you see is, it appears like we have here fibrils, but you will see these are not fibrils, these are polymorphic ribbons, as a matter of fact. But you see that, unlike in many other cases, basically we have plenty of macromolecular complexes inhabiting the aggregate material. Now, we can do again this kind of molecule by molecule analysis here. And <clears throat> what we see is basically, I think we can very easily identify, of course, ribosomes. They cannot penetrate the aggregate material. We see in the vicinity of the aggregate material the eukaryotic chaperonin trick, forming also clusters always located close to, to the ribosomes. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Then, basically, it's only one molecular species inside the aggregate material, and that is the 26S processor. <clears throat> and uh, it's about uh, a 40-fold um, increase in the local concentration compared to the remainder of the cell. Now, <clears throat> given the fact that we have so many proteasomes there, we can do a deeper analysis, we can push resolution quite a bit. The green guys here are those that are in the ground state. The blue ones are those that are in the substrate processing state. So here we have more, so we can, resolution is a little bit higher than it is here in the substrate processing state. But what we see is that all those that are identified based on the confirmation as being in the substrate processing state have additional densities not accounted for by the density of the proteasome itself. Now, what we can do is we can map back again but differentiate between those identified as substrate processing or ground state and um, you see here, I mean, those are in the substrate processing state, invariably, they are in direct contact with the aggregate material. So our interpretation is here essentially um, <clears throat> that the proteasome becomes trapped in these aggregate materials because they try to degrade the aggregate material, but they fail to do so because they are unable to um, unfold, I mean, uh, proteins with this D-peptide repeat. This is known to be also a defense mechanism of some viruses.